So I'm going to make this introduction very, very short. Uh, simply to say that he is a professor at Ohio State, uh, distinguished university professor at Ohio State, has taught at Yale and other universities, and also in, in, in Great Britain. And I, I can just summarize, if you don't mind, his bibliographical accomplishments. If you're going to write anything about early modern Europe, or if you're going to write anything about military history, you're going to be reading a hell of a lot of Jeffrey Parker. Uh, and with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. That must be the first time in my life that someone has said I shall just give a very brief introduction. That does so. <laughs> <laughs> very gracious one. Now, as you see, we have two agenda items before us today. Do you want to walk yet for sound sounds there? Or something like no, that? we're okay. okay. Uh, global crisis, 17th century perspective, which is what I do. And then are we doomed? Is what those two guys over there do. Now, I remember very clearly, as if it were yesterday, the moment when I became interested in the global crisis. It wasn't as an undergrad, although as an undergrad I wrote, I read those articles on the general crisis by Eric Hobsbawm and Hugh Trevor Roper, as well as the sundry critiques of their views published in the journal Past and Present between 1954 and 1960. And if you want an easy Introduction and read the fast shrift presented to Professor Rabb sitting in the front row there, uh, in which John Eliot, who was a participant, gives a wonderful countdown of what it was like to read those articles and to see them come out between 54 and 60. But even then, although breathtakingly erudite, I was puzzled that none of the participants in the debate went beyond Europe. I knew there was something wrong. But I didn't know what it was until one evening in 1976 I was listening to the radio. The older members will remember radios. Uh, uh, you listen to them, there was no video, there was no YouTube, you just listen to it. And on this occasion in 1976 there was an interview with a man called Jack Eddy, who was a solar physicist, and he had just published an extraordinary paper in the journal Science on what he called the Maunder Minimum, the period between 1645 and 1715, when virtually no sunspots appear on the face of the sun. And he noted that this sunspot minimum coincided with the reign of Louis XIV, the Sun King. It was a lousy joke in 1976, it hasn't been. <laughs> what he did note, however, was that this is not this is a really important distinction. It was not absence of evidence, it was evidence of absence. Because you have, in the wake of Galileo's invention of the powerful telescope, you have a lot of astronomers around Europe looking for sunspots and not seeing them. There are, in fact, 8,000 days on which we have at least one observation between 1643 and 1715. And we come prepared when we live at state universities. We don't expect to find pointers, so we bring our own. You'll see that there is absolutely no sunspots. Even before, there are not very many. You see them at the beginning. Galileo sees the 11-year cycle. Starts again, 1710. But you don't see it before. And Eddie speculated that this, this phenomenon and just to give you an idea, there are about 100 sunspots in all observed between 1643 and 1710. That's 100 sunspots is what we have in an average year in the 20th century. One year. That's the total for 70. And Eddie noticed that this coincided not only with the reign of the Sun King, but also with the period of extraordinary political upheaval, and he thought that maybe that the reduction of solar energy received on Earth had some sort of impact on human affairs. Speculated, in fact, that there was a link between global cooling and the general crisis, a link between the Maunder Minimum and the general crisis. And I found that so plausible and so exciting that I wrote to Jack Eddy and I decided to put together a collection of essays on the general crisis. I edited with one of my former students called Leslie Smith. And we requested and we received Eddie's permission to include his article for the science in our book in 1978. I think that was the first application of solar physics 
to modern history. It now appears that we are going into another prolonged at sunspot minimum, so perhaps it will not be the last association between solar physics and modern history. But of course, Eddy had identified only one part of the explanation for what climatologists call the Little Ice Age, a period in which glaciers advance, there is a marked period of global cooling. Yes, the absence of sunspots contributes, but there are other things too. One of them is an extraordinary increase in the number of El Nino events, and that's what you're looking at here. Now, this is for you, David Bell. As you'll see, there is an extraordinary increase in El Nino. This is Southern Hemisphere, this is Northern Hemisphere. <coughs> you get an extraordinary increase in El Nino at around 1789, which some of you may remember saw a little turbulence in some parts of Europe. <laughs> you also get the same thing around 1349, which those of you who know your 14th century will recall sees also upheavals and, of course, the spread of a catastrophic epidemic across Eurasia. This is uh, one of the things we do at Ohio State, is we have the Bird Polar Research Institute, which goes and gets ice cores from glaciers, polar ice caps, glaciers in South America, uh, Kilimanjaro, etc. while there still is one. And this is a really, I don't think any of you will have seen this slide, but it is, it does show a slight increase in the 1650s in the Northern Hemisphere, less so in the Southern Hemisphere, but there is clearly uh, 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 an intensification in uh, El Nino, but what really changes is the frequency. El Ninos happen twice as often in the mid 17th century as they do today. And most El Ninos are associated with extreme weather in certain parts of the world, Europe, <coughs> and Northeast America being another. A third factor in earth science which has come up is the coincidence between volcanic activity track down here with this huge uh, 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 concentration of volcanic activity in the 1640s and temperature as reconstructed uh, uh, from proxy data. And as you see, temperatures go down as volcanic activity goes up. There is an extraordinary concentration of volcanic activity during this period. So in the 70s and the 80s, the years after Jack Eddy produces his article, uh, earth scientists become more and more <coughs> interested in the mid-17th century and in the link between climate and history, but historians are not really listening. The general crisis debate goes dormant, <coughs> uh, languishes until 1989 when William S. Atwell, a historian of Ming China, put together a panel at the American Association of Asian Studies, AAAS, on, and this is its title, The General Crisis in East Asia. And the presentations were published the next year, 1990, in Modern Asian Studies. Contributions by John Richards, Anthony Reed, Neil Stainscott, and Bill Atwell, showing that in East Asia too, you have a general crisis. The historical side of that missing dimension from the Hobsbawm Trevor Roper debate. And uh, in 1997, Leslie Smith and I included all of those essays as well as one on Germany in the 17th century by another of my former students, Sheila Ogilvy, in a new and expanded edition of our essay collection, The General Crisis of the 17th Century. And it was as I did that that I realized that this was my new research project, a global history, a world crisis book. And I, um, I had the idea in the middle of the night. I know this because I, I rather breathlessly wrote an email uh, to a friend uh, uh, as I woke up just 16 years ago, February 1998. <coughs> Last night I awoke at 4 a.m. and realized that I wanted to write a book about the general crisis of the 17th century. Not a collection of essays, been there, done that, but an integrated narrative and analytical account of the first global crisis for which we possess adequate documentation for Asia, Africa, the Americas, and Europe. My account would adopt a Brodelian structure, nothing modest about my emails in those days, would adopt a Brodelian structure examining long-term factors, climate above all, media around changes, economic fluctuations and so on, and events from the English Civil War and the crisis in the French and Spanish monarchies through the murder of two Ottoman sultans, the civil wars in India and sub-Saharan Africa to the collapse of Ming China and the wars around the Great Lakes of North America. The book would examine why such synchronic developments occur with so little warning, and why do they end? 
So, I mean, that's the summary of what you see there. It just took me 16 years to do it. Uh, I prepared a proposal entitled The World Crisis, 1635 to 1665, which secured a publication contract and fellowships that enabled me to start serious writing in 2001. I promised to deliver the book within two years in 2003. <laughs> it finally appeared in March 2013. How could I be so wrong? Well, it took me a while to realize that 1635 to 65 were the wrong dates. You can't start in 1635, it's <coughs> sense. You have to go back, uh, and there is a convenient date, it's 1618. You have to go back to 1618. Even people at the time recognize that things changed in 1680s. They look back, they notice that it was the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. If they were Chinese, it was the Manchu Declaration of War on Ming China. And it was also, although this was less clear, the beginning of a serious episode of political cooling. Uh, for the first and only time in history, the Bosporus freezes over, and men and women walk across the ice between Europe and Asia. The only time it happens. So there was my beginning point. And as I say, even contemporaries, at least three historians, one in China and two in Europe, when they look back, say, 1618 and when things began to look wrong. I should have read more of Ted Rabb because I then would have realized that 1665 also made no sense. And it's not really until the 1680s that a measure of stability takes hold. This chronological extension from 1618 to the 1680s, coupled with an avalanche of publications on both the climate and the history of the 17th century, of course required far more research and far more writing than I had ever anticipated. I even had to abandon my title, The World Crisis, because another former advisee who was rashly sitting in the audience, Kate Epstein, cruelly reminded me that the title had already been used. Winston Churchill entitled his history of World War I, The World Crisis, and she also reminded me even more cruelly that his colleague A.J. Balfour had waspishly dismissed the book as Winston's brilliant autobiography disguised as a history of the universe. <laughs> so world crisis is out, global crisis is in. So how do you write a true history of the globe? Even 400 years ago, there's a billion people, a billion humans living on it. They're already on all the continents, even Australia. But gradually as I plowed through, I saw a pattern in the sources. In fact, I realized that all the sources fit into two categories, and only two categories. You have the natural archive. This is what climatologists do. They look for things like ice cores. It's what my colleague Lonnie Thompson does. That was where that dramatic slide that I showed you about El Nino's cancer. They look at the movement of glaciers. They find, for example, that the Alpine glaciers reached their greatest extent in 1641. They look at palynology, a useful word, uh, pollen, spores, <coughs> deposited in lakes, ponds, and estuaries. And they look above all at tree rings, because every year, every tree lays down a growth ring. A fat growth ring means a good year for crops. A narrow growth ring, especially with what are called frost spikes, indicate a lousy year for and when we talk about these days, when we talk about dendrochronology, it's not just one tree here and one tree there. We're looking at 20 or 30 trees in each station. Something like 2,000 stations in North America going back to 1500. Every one of them is several trees, and they all tell the same story. It's quite extraordinary. But it's not alone. I said all my data is in two sources. This is one group. The second group is what I call the human archive which consists of the narratives, weather diaries, chronicles, letters, uh, numerical data. For example, every year in France, there's a collective decision on when to harvest the grapes. And that date is recorded. A good year, you'll have an early harvest, but a bad year, you'll have a late harvest. If you do this serially, if you look at all the vineyards, all the villages, you get a remarkably precise view of whether it was a good growing season for grapes, and perhaps by inference, other crops, or whether it was a bad year. Pictorial <coughs> information, quite a lot of uh, paintings, 
most of you will have seen the remarkable Dutch art uh, of, of, of winter scenes. Uh, uh, shows you what it was like. It doesn't. It's not a, 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 um, a quantitative measure, but it is a qualitative index. And then you come to epigraphic or archaeological information. <laughs> Abandoned villages because the water level rose, or because a glacier eclipsed or evaporated <laughs> the village. Uh, uh, epigraphic, above all, the marks on bridges showing how high the highest tide was, how high the highest water was. All of these things appear. So those are my two data sets. And having figured that out, which took me some years, uh, I made three structural, if you like, architectural choices which are reflected in the book. First of all, I decided I would start with common denominators. I would look at those things, those aspects of existence shared by all or almost all humans in the course of the 17th century, starting with their experience of global cooling. What did it do to you when the temperature, the average global temperature died and dropped by one or two degrees? It doesn't sound very much. But remember the difference between the medieval maximum and the little ice age is six degrees. The warmest record that we have in the past two millennia is six degrees above the 1640s. So a drop of two degrees is one third of that difference. You notice, what's it do to you? What are the consequences? Second, I looked at how humans have the capacity to make things worse or better. Worse principally through war, but also sometimes through the perverse application of an unpopular policy. Uh, my favorite example was the uh, tors ten torsorial castration e edict, which the Manchus impose on their Chinese subjects after they take over Beijing in 1644. They decree that every male will have to shave his head, as they do. Now, that's a very clever one, because you have to keep doing it. You have to keep shaving your head, so it's a constant sign of submission, and that really creates opposition. So whereas North China falls in four months. South China takes four decades. And there's no reason for it. It's what we would say in Glasgow is crossing the street to pick a fight. And yet, that's what happens in the 17th century. So humans, for, for all sorts of reasons, can make a bad situation worse. Then I looked at the areas most <coughs> likely to be affected by this fatal synergy between human and natural factors. I looked at those who lived on lands that were already marginal, where uh, even a short decrease, small decrease in temperatures, or a small increase in the number of double famine years, is very significant. I looked at those who lived in towns and cities who were very vulnerable because they could never produce enough food to support themselves. And I looked at those who lived in the larger industrialized or proto-industrialized regions like Holland, or Jiangnan, the lower Yangtze Valley, where economic specialization had created very large populations which were equally vulnerable. They were absolutely dependent on exporting the goods they produced and importing the food they needed. And if either of those changed, if the markets to which they exported folded, <coughs> or if the areas from which they imported food became inaccessible to them, they would starve. This last denominator, this last common denominator, what happened in the heartland of the crisis was the hardest, the most somber. How did humans react to the crisis? Somber because there are only three strategies. If suddenly your resources are less than you need, either you have to reduce births or you have to increase deaths or increase migration. There are really the only three strategies open to you. The balance between them changes. The mix, if you like, between the strategies changes. How I wish I had been able to read this fantastic book by Fabian Brixler of Yale uh, on infanticide. Mabiki is the word used for both abortion and infanticide, early infanticide. It means thinning out. It's the same word you use for seedlings with rice. You have to thin out the seedlings so that you have enough, but not more than enough, to keep going. And that's the word you use. And as you see from this very graphic picture, uh, there is the midwife squeezing the life out of a daughter because it's overwhelming. Girls were murdered at birth. I mean, infanticide is 100% certain 
in achieving the gender balance that you want. And the spirit of the dead child is about to uh, 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 take its revenge, but the look on the face of the midwife is very evocative. In Western Europe, that would have landed you up in court. Uh, in fact, the commonest offence in some jurisdictions is infanticide in the 17th century. The 17th century sees it as a sin. In modern, early modern Europe, it is a sin to kill a child. Those of you who read Sir Walter Scott may remember in the heart of Midlothian that the change in the law to prevent infanticide actually changes the rules of evidence. All you need to prove infanticide is a dead baby and you did not call for assistance. You, the mother, did not call for assistance. That's a primary face of case of infanticide. China and Japan, exactly the opposite. It's the state which determines what strategies you can use and what strategies you can't. So, if you like the second structural choice I made, having made the structural choice of getting those common denominators at the first, the first couple of hundred pages of the book, uh, the next couple of hundred pages uh, are organized by state. I present the heartland of the crisis according to political units. There's a chapter on China, followed by chapters on the Russian Empire and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a chapter on the Ottoman Empire, a chapter on Germany, on the Iberian Peninsula, on France, and on Great Britain. In each of those states, the government was, shall we say, successful in turning a climate-induced crisis into a catastrophe. Where we have demographic data, we can actually measure the way in which <coughs> this happens. This is um, Marie-Angélique Carnot. I'm sorry I didn't have a, um, a, a, an acute accent for her, but uh, uh, my word process will not do it on PowerPoint. Uh, there's Port Royal des Champs, just outside Paris, uh, uh, where she was abbess. And in 1652, uh, as she looks around her and sees what the French Civil War called the Fronde has done, and what the climate, the harvest failures have done, she says, a third of the world has died. And she goes on to say, so much desolation must signify the end of the world. Well, the world didn't end, but she was right about the third of mankind. I mean, it's an extraordinary figure. It's obviously a, a sort of an impression. But where we have the uh, burials, I'm sorry, French, you know, I, I talked to them about this, but they will insist on doing their slides and everything in French. So, sepulture, the burials, uh, uh, baptême, uh, baptisms, uh, each one is a different community. They're all in the Ile de France. And you'll see that 1652, when Mère Angélique makes a comment, is precisely when you get a spike in burials. It's the worst catastrophe in early modern French history. Probably is a third of the human population because of the combination of climate and war. What about the rest of the world? <clears throat> These are the countries which really get it in the mid-17th century. What about the rest? Well, the world beyond the heartland was more of a problem, but I decided to organize those partly by state. Uh, I looked at those areas which, in which, should we say, a crisis didn't become a catastrophe, either because the rulers introduced policies to mitigate rather than exacerbate the problem, uh, uh, and the ones that come to mind are Mughal India, which was just so wealthy <coughs> that they could fight wars and do welfare. They could do warfare and welfare together. And Tokugawa, Japan, uh, where they deliberately, the shoguns deliberately start legislation to mitigate the crisis and also to avoid foreign wars. They, they are offered the chance to uh, uh, intervene abroad and they turn it down. So that's one sort of uh, uh, difference. A second sort of difference is that several of these societies clearly have a demographic cushion. And again, Tokugawa, Japan. Uh, it's clear that the population uh, in 1600 and 1640 is far below uh, uh, the maximum. This is not a society in which the population is already pressing at the limits. And we know that because the population of Tokugawa, Japan, although it's hotly disputed, some say 12 million, some say 15 million, which is a big difference in 1600, but in 1700, it's 30 million. So even if you take the upper figure of 15 million, there's a population which doubles in the course of the 17th century despite the crisis. So there is a demographic cushion. And some of the areas which seem to have escaped the worst of the crisis seem to have that demographic cushion. 
either the, as in the equatorial territories, the resources are so abundant that you can still feed everybody, <coughs> or else you have a government which mitigates, which puts forward, for example, the Tokugawa government says rice will only be used for food, no sake, only for food. Uh, and the, an irritating series of extraordinarily detailed pieces of legislation come out telling you where you can have night soil, where you must plant trees, trying to make sure that the local food resources will stretch. As far as I can tell, that's the only case. <coughs> Tokugawa is the only society, it seems to me, that it won't get it right. So, in some of them, however, I have to say I come across Jack Eddy's distinction. We're dealing really with absence of evidence, not evidence of absence. Most of the southern hemisphere it's really too difficult to see. The data is not yet sufficiently robust to be able to tell what the impact of the crisis was. So I put those in that section of the book, part three, in another 200 pages, in which I look at those areas which seem, seem not to have suffered as much. So I then make a third structural decision in composing the book, which is I will try in each of these different chapters each of these different states to combine what, so switching metaphors, horizontal and vertical soundings. You can't read everything. So I look for horizontal, I look for those which were uh, covering uh, uh, large regions with a particular set of data, such as the Mercurial, which recorded the weekly price of grain in uh, large regions, Paris, for example, Ile de France. I looked at the annual London bills of mortality which give the total number who die each year by category of disease. I looked at the county gazetteers of China, which always begin with a section, a very long section on the climatic variations of that year. Well, of course I didn't look at them. Someone had aggregated them all for me, all 1,500, 1500 Chinese counties, there's a lot of gazetteers, and they've been calibrated. And I link them with eyewitness accounts, or as the Dutch would say, with ego documents that reveal what had happened over time to one person, or to one family, or to one community in each region <coughs> over time. So I got a diachronic perspective from my ego documents and a synchronic perspective from my data sets. In Japan, I was lucky to find the detailed memoirs <coughs> kept by a salt merchant from Saitama north of Edo, Tokyo, as it is today. His name was Inomoto Yazeimon, and he kept detailed notes on the climate. And I was able to calibrate those with indications of the weather, like when the cherry blossoms bloom. The date is always recorded when the first cherry blossom blooms. <coughs> so you get some idea of when spring begins. Also, when ice cracks on certain lakes. And it's a significant event that everybody records. So you can tell, yeah, that really was a year when it, the winter was extraordinarily long. In Russia, I found the regular dispatches of the only resident foreign diplomat during the 1640s, a Swedish diplomat called Karl Anders Pommerling, who every month sent reports to Queen Christina of Sweden, and also sent her transcripts of documents from the Russian rebellions, which have been lost today. In fact, if you look in today's edition, of Russian history, you will find uh, the transcript that I commissioned of Pommer and Ings, uh, the article is called Moscow's Lost Petition to the Tsar of June 1648. Pommer and Ings was a very smart diplomat and his sources were my uh, diachronic source on the Russian information and I linked it with climate and population data. And best of all, I found the 1641 deposition. Alt tab. Ah, right. Current the long bit. So, after the rising in large parts of <coughs> Ireland on the 23rd of October 1641, there is an official investigation into what happened. And a series of judges, all of them, of course, Protestant, take down depositions from about 2,000 men and 600 women of what they had seen and heard and suffered after three disastrous harvests in 1639, 40, and 41, as their Catholic neighbors rose up and 
turn them out of their homes. It's generated, this event generated a larger volume of personal testimony than any other event in the 17th century, perhaps, than in the whole of early modern history, because there's 20,000 pages of sworn depositions. It's all been digitized. Just give me a second, I'm going to be rather a neophyte with technology, but I'm going to try and fire up one. So, uh, county. site for a moment, because what I'm going to um, find for you here is uh, the deposition of a particular Protestant fisherman from Newry in the county of Armagh, and he describes how sharply, shortly after the uprising began, he and his wife and five small children were stripped of all their clothes by their Catholic neighbours, and that night, and I'm quoting now, flying away for safety, naked in the frost. One poor daughter of his, seeing him and her mother grieve for their general misery, in way of comforting, said she wasn't cold, nor would she cry. But immediately afterwards, she died of cold and want. And the first night, this deponent and his wife, creeping for shelter into a poor shack, were glad to lie upon their children to keep in them heat and save them alive. Now, what makes this and hundreds of other depositions remarkable is that it is the 23rd of October in a country which very rarely sees snow and frost at all. So, these 20,000 pages of deposition, just because they've been scanned, if one were to type in, <coughs> as one will, uh, snow and frost, you get uh, 66 different depositions. No, admittedly. They include a Mr. Frost, who is a deponent and Mrs. Snow, who is a victim. <laughs> but most of them are, in fact, uh, uh, the depositions of people who are uh, in some way affected. Uh, the one I was reading was Thomas Richardson, uh, who I thought would come up first, but he doesn't. But never mind, you just have to take it. So it's 6930 six, results. So it's a very, very interesting way of finding out. And those who've done this, and this is all available, all you need to do is register absolutely free all being, actually I will show you one because if you don't believe the transcript, you can read <coughs> the original for William Hillsworth. And it'll give you the, uh, the scan uh, of what he said. Here he is, the information of William Hillsworth Clark. So, so he's, uh, he's a Protestant uh, minister's assistant. Kildare, County Kildare, the manuscript, etc. And view original. There it is. And you can bring it up. I mean, it's just extraordinary. 20,000 pages. This came online in 2010, just in time for me to have to rewrite that chapter. Uh, so uh, you can an experiment and look at these and calculate them as I have done, and you will find if you look at the incidence of snow and frost and the incidence of extreme cold, and then you look at violence, you can see that twice as many, at least twice as many people die of the Little Ice Age as die of cancer. So the Little Ice Age duplicates or maybe even triplicates the impact of the rising. Survivors at the time said that 1641, and I quote, was a more bitter winter than was of some years before or since seen in Ireland. But the world is full, is it not, ladies and gentlemen, of people who say, this is the worst winter, but probably saying it now, this is the worst memory, I can't remember a worse winter. Funny thing is, when you look at the... Uh, Hard data from the Earth scientists, 1641 really was the third coldest winter in the 17th century. So the Protestants of Ireland are doubly unlucky. Their Catholic neighbors turn on them, and they happen to turn on them and turn them out in the coldest winter of the third coldest winter of the century, and that's why they all die. Well, um, we're not drawing bullseyes around bullet holes. Irish Protestants really do know what they're talking about when they say this is an extraordinary and terrible event. Um, that's how you can turn a crisis driven <coughs> crisis, a climate driven crisis into a catastrophe. All you have to do is 
pages and pages and pages of sources. Or if you want to do a global history, you have to pay to play. And you have to find people, as I did, who can translate the letters and transcripts of Karl Anders Pomeranian and the journal of um, Kinomoto Yazemon. And then you have to follow what Richard Rhodes called the Knickerbocker rule. You apply ass to chair. And if you apply ass to chair for 16 years, that's what you get. <laughs> so, moving on briefly to the second part of the assignment. Was it worth it? Was it really worth spending 16 years? Well, um, are we doomed to repeat history? Question that Miguel gave me to answer. Well, a global crisis is, is a book with a purpose. It is meant to counter the commonest reaction to environmental catastrophe today, which is, of course, denial. In just 17 days in August 2003, the most intense heat wave recorded in France since meteorological records began claimed the lives of at least 15,000 people. In some parts of the Ile de France, the same area that uh, Mayor Angelique talked about, some parts of Ile de France mortality was quadruple the normal level for August. Some, like me, thought it was the heat wave, the canicule. President Chirac knew better. No, it was not anything to do with the heat. It was all to do with sin and the breakdown of family authority. He, of course, was on holiday in Canada. He eventually had to come back and very ill-temperedly said, the problem is the breakdown in family values. You French left your aged parents at home when you went to the beach in August, and they all died in the heat. He, he, oh, yeah, heat exhaustion. Well, but it's your fault. It's sin. Sin. The problem is human agency, not structure. Two years later, in 2005, we have Hurricane Katrina, which killed over 2,000 people and destroyed property worth over $81 billion in an area of the United States which is almost three times the size of England. For many Catholic and Protestant evangelists, this was nothing to do with the fact that New Orleans is right in the track of hurricanes. It is to do with the fact that there was going to be a gay pride procession in the near future, and this was God's punishment. And if it wasn't that, then it was the fact that America allows abortion and sodom. These are what provoke God's wrath. Again, it isn't, it isn't the environment, it's us. It's all about us. There's a reassuring, con oh, perhaps not reassuring, but there is a continuity with the 17th century. But whatever the role of sin, both those disasters were predictable. The world is getting warmer, there will be canicule. If there is canicule, <coughs> little old ladies and little old men left up in garrets in Paris are going to die of heat exhaustion. There are more hurricanes of terrific strength. But governments with the power to mobilize more resources and wealth than any of their predecessors failed and continue to fail, both to prepare and to cope. And remember, these are local disasters. How would these same governments cope with a global disaster like the one I've described in the 1640s? We know with absolute certainty that climatic catastrophes have happened in the past. We can be pretty sure they will continue to happen in the future. We just deny that they're going to happen now, or at least that they're going to happen to us. And we need to get beyond denial. We need to recognize that the two distinct methodologies exist to help us. One is the one that we often try, if you see history as a tape, remember tape recorders, you fast forward. So you can fast forward the tape of history and use current trends to predict what might happen the day after tomorrow. It's what climatologists do, sociologists do, political scientists do, and very few historians do, which I think is correct, because what historians can and should do is rewind the tape of history and see what happened last time the sun went out. <coughs> see what happened last time there was a year without a sun which is 1816. Look at the 1340s, as my colleague Bruce Campbell is doing, to see the interplay of climate and human stupidity. Very few have systematically attempted this, and yet there is the material there. There's all this material, more than a single person could possibly read. I did a selection in the book. The vast human and natural archive offers a rare opportunity for interested historians to engage with scholars in other disciplines who are concerned with the fate of our planet. This is our chance, this is our time. The environmental turn is upon us. 
Studying causal mechanisms and coping strategies hundreds of years ago will not prevent the onset of another climatic catastrophe, but if we historians can identify the structural, political, economic, and ideological factors in each afflicted society around the world that prevented or facilitated an appropriate response during the past, if we historians consider how the outcomes could have been different, we may learn something useful about the impact of environmental disasters and how best to cope with them. And I think that's what sociologists to be presentists and uh, bring this discussion a little bit to, to today. Uh, my colleagues Ian and I are going to uh, interrogate some of the things that Jeffrey has, uh, has talked about and written in his book and try to bring the discussion to one that uh, can focus a little bit more what lessons from the 17th century can be learned. Um, so I want to begin by uh, distinguishing between two different types of, of events that we might call catastrophic or critical. The first are those that are clear existential threats and that do enough damage on their own to basically wreck havoc. Uh, asteroids hitting the Earth, nuclear winter, the collapse of Atlantis, whatever you will. Uh, these are events are crises in of themselves. An asteroid comes, it destroys everything, well, there's not much, very much to explain. A very different event is one that, while well, having some negative impact, does not in and of itself create that much direct damage, but creates a chain reaction that could lead to catastrophe. Uh, the classic example of this is a tree falling, hitting a power line, and then all hell breaks, uh, breaks loose. Uh, many of these are idiosyncratic, but some but remain <coughs> consequential. Others tend to reflect underlying conditions. Um, there is one side of explanations of this, the sort of the want of a nail school. On the other side, we can speak of overplanting and overpopulation creating conditions in which these small failures can lead to catastrophes. Another way of differentiating between these events is one where the event itself is what matters. Um, that is, it gets colder, it gets drier, whatever. And in others, it is simply the change in variance that it's not so much that conditions have shifted in one direction or the other, but that it becomes much, it becomes much harder to predict what's going to happen. Uh, and and that, that is, again, a, a distinction between these kinds of, of events. So my questions uh, for, for Jeffrey is, first, where do we place the Little Ice Age? Obviously, it had a disastrous effect on nutrition and health, and this subsequently leads to the decline in legitimacy of governments just about uh, everywhere. Uh, I want to probe to see if climate played a larger role in this. To what extent was this climate, uh, the tree branch falling, was it the tree falling, was it the power system collapsing? Where would we place causally the, 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 the change in, 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 in climates? And interestingly, where were, they, were, were the underlying conditions worse or better for this sort of catastrophic diffusion? Um, and I want to give you, I want you to give us an example of where you think climactic change created this kind of catastrophic cycle. And let's just use the perhaps the most obvious one. Um, obviously, the Little Ice Age makes the Thirty Years' War much, much worse. But does it play a role in causing it? Um, are they, you know, sorry for the bad pun, but are they opening up the windows in Prague and let some? Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Uh, uh, <laughs> Or is, is it just completely idiosyncratic and has nothing to do with, with the climate? Does the climate simply make it much worse, or does it begin a process that, 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 that then becomes bad? Given the distribution of responses to these climatic changes, what conditions appear to be more resilient or robust? The example of talking about with Japan was very interesting. And the reason for that is that it was operating uh, much below the margin for its population. And I think for the 21st century, it's very interesting since we are operating very much on the margin in terms of food, in terms of transport, in terms of energy use. So our, our, our room for error, again, is, is less. Is that the critical thing? Should we basically create more slack in, 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 in our systems? Um, it, and one of the things that we are studying in the uh, global systemic risk community, of which this is a part, is the emergence of properties or the possibility of chaotic disruptions 
that come from interaction of what could be local events. I was fascinated when I first started reading this, this notion of a global crisis that is not just about this climate change occurring throughout the world, but this climate change occurring in enough places which produces reactions which then create the kind of interactions that make the situation much, 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 much worse. So my questions to you are, to what extent is this just a very bad thing happening and those can't be avoided by policy, those can't be studied sociologically, or is this a kind of event where policies and attitudes can mitigate this, this effect and can actually reduce this kind of diffusion of, of, of catastrophe? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Zia Lee. I'm actually a physicist, not a sociologist or a historian, but um, I'm actually in the Woodrow Wilson School and part of a program on science and global security. I mean, the global security we worry about is not so much climate change, but nuclear war and things like that, but it was uh, an offer that I couldn't refuse to be part of this discussion, so a couple of observations and then some questions. The first is that um, <coughs> in his book, Jeffrey Parker has this sentence where he kind of, for me, which summed up a context for where we are today, and he said that many of those who lived in the 17th century reacted to adversity and anxiety which they could neither explain nor avoid. And that led me to, to think two things. One is that this raises the question of anticipation um, in shaping the kinds of ways of thinking that people had as they experienced weather, local weather in the 17th century. Because, you know, people, deal with weather, not climate. And with that, you also have to keep in mind that seasons repeat. The human experience is that there will be next year. And the idea that it's going to be like this year after year shapes how you think about what's appropriate and how to prepare and what you're actually anticipating. I mean, this winter in Princeton is some of us a lesson about how bad winter here gets. Um, but when people were thinking about what would, they were actually going through, there's this question of what they anticipated the future to be like, how much more of this there was going to be, how bad could it get. And uh, he makes clear in his book that for lots of people, they did not and could not expect what was happening and did not know how to understand the, the the process of climate change that was taking place. And that's why the quote from the abbess is so interesting, that she saw this as the end of the world, whereas now we can see, yeah, so it lasted a few decades and then population started to revive and, and, and things changed. So the first <coughs> thing is that thinking about where we are today, there's clearly a sense of anticipation that is already prevalent about climate change. Right? We can see the doom. Right? And we have better models than people could have imagined even a decade ago about how some of the relationships between climate and weather work. So one question is, are there examples from the 17th century where knowing and anticipation, for whatever reason, good luck or what, actually made a difference in how people prepared and responded to the great crisis? I mean, the example of Japan is interesting in the sense that you seem to have a society which has learned how to practice the politics of scarcity. And so when they see that, they respond in a way that they know how to deal with. But so the question is, does knowing make a difference? Are there examples where knowing makes a difference? The second was you know, the point where they could neither explain nor avoid, and that's the question of powerlessness in the face of climate shift, climatic shifts. And so in his book, and it's, you know, there are great stories about how people felt powerless, but they also saw their rulers as powerless. And it changes the relationship between people and those who govern them to see that our society and those who run our lives cannot deal with the situation that we're in. So some people turn to God in prayer, and the rulers and clergy, he gives instances, actually encourage people to, to pray for you know, better weather and better harvest. And you still find this commonplace, and it's actually amazing that 
in Pakistan just a couple of years ago, there was a severe drought, and the prime minister went on television and told people to pray for rain. The Texas governor did the same yeah. thing. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, um, but other people, you know, he, he writes about, they just seem to have sat and starved um, and went hungry. Others killed themselves uh, or had fewer children or moved. But then there are also all the, the, the civil wars and the uprisings and the rebellions and the peasant protests, which are not people you know, being powerless. They're actually trying to intervene and, and shape what's happening. And so one of the things is that in some places, rulers dealt with these kinds of rebellions. <coughs> so the second question I had is, the, how did the situations in which rulers actually undertook reforms, how much of it had to do with this kind of rebellion? Right? That there was this sense of discontent and the collective action by people. And lastly, uh, the general crisis of the 17th century, as he says, did end. And populations which had, in some cases, fallen catastrophically did recover. Societies uh, uh, reorganized themselves in, in, in ways. And I'm actually reminded of Christopher Hill's book about the 17th century in England, uh, the century of revolution, in which he says it was the most decisive century, perhaps, in English history. But he, there's not a single mention of climate anywhere in that book. And, but it's all about how different and, you know, in many ways, better England was at the end of it than at the beginning of it. So the question is, to, to what extent did these great upheavals actually trigger the creation of new social institutions? <coughs> And in what circumstances is it that the climate process and dealing with it actually um, restored traditional institutions? Because people saw, you know, whether it was because of sin or whatever, the need to recreate society from before the general crisis. So, thank you. Now, would you like to respond to that first? Yeah, and then see what the other side Okay. Why don't we take it from there? Any questions? <coughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, one case I wanted to ask you about, since you've uh, done a, a great deal of research on, is the case of the Netherlands. Um, so there we have a case in the 17th century where there's a, the Golden Age. Um, we do have pictures like Bruegel's uh, winter scenes, but we also have um, great wealth. I mean, is this just a story about Spanish failure in the midst of this climate, or, or how do you see the Dutch case fitting in? Take a couple and then yeah, I, I, if I might. Yes. So I very much like this term phrase that people deal with weather, not with climate. Um, and I wonder if there are other, it, it strikes me that um, weather is almost a vernacular category of analysis, whereas climate is an elite category of analysis. And I wonder if there are other um, points, uh, almost conceptual shifts um, that would need to happen. Um, in order for humans to come to grips with um, the climatic challenges uh, confronting them. So th I, that's a wonderful point of phrase. Okay. Um, my colleague graciously uh, gave me advanced sight of, of their, their thinking, so I, I've had a little while um, to, to, to contemplate. Uh, let me therefore first answer the uh, uh, two questions from the audience. First of all, the Netherlands. Uh, Netherlands is uh, a, a fluid category. Um, in the uh, up to 1572, it's 17 provinces which all obey Spain. In 1573, it's much the same, but two provinces have defied. By 1577, 16 provinces have defied, and by the time you get back to 1585, it's about 10. Uh, not all of the seven in the Dutch Republic do very well. Uh, the areas on the periphery, in fact, uh, uh, are constantly fought over. Uh, they're constantly put under contributions by the Spaniards. Uh, they begin to develop industries to supply the garrisons. Some of them begin to develop their saddles, uh, uh, farriers who have horseshoes and so on. And then it comes the peace in 1648. And with the peace comes the most catastrophic rains. It rains and rains and rains in 1648. Uh, Professor Rab and I were having 
uh, uh, lunch, and uh, uh, he, he mentioned the diary of Fabio Chidi, uh, the papal diplomat at the conference, uh, the, the peace conference in Westphalia. And Chidi talks endlessly about the rain. And again, we, we have weather diaries which show this is not an accident. It really does. 1648 really is a dreadful year over uh, Northwest Europe. So uh, uh, I think the illusion of the Dutch Golden Age, uh, uh, the, the good years are there, uh, but they are also uh, uh, flanked by a considerable number of bad years. Uh, there is a definite anti-peace movement after the end of the war with Spain, saying you know, we were better off when we were fighting the Spaniards. God was not pleased that we sold out with some toleration for Catholics. We need to fight Spain again. We need to renew the war. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 in uh, looking back in the 18th century, it looks like a golden age. You don't see that much of the golden age expression at the time. So I, I uh, fitted the Netherlands into my chapter on the Thirty Years' War. It's called Germany and its Neighbors, which is a sort of cop out, because it enables me to deal with the Swiss the Swedes, the Danes, and the Dutch, as well as the Germans. Uh, but there are common denominators, and one of them is that 1648 is just an absolute dreadful year. There's a revolution all over. And I think the only reason why Germany makes peace is they're totally exhausted. I do believe in this demographic cushion. Uh, I mean, it seems to me one of the reasons why the crisis comes to an end is that uh, uh, reduced births, increased migration, an enormous increase in deaths has simply reduced the number of consumers. So in the end, the balance between supply and demand comes back into And in Germany, you have that situation, and there, there is no nostalgia for the war. I know of no German state, no German society that says, well, we should go back to fighting again on the country. 1648 to 1740, when we have Frederick II gets going, there is no internal German. So it solves, Westphalia solves quite a lot of problems. It doesn't solve as many in the Netherlands. It's, it, it, there, there certainly, there are, there are winners and losers in every society. <coughs> Hamburg wins in the 30th war. It's much stronger in 1648 than it was in 1680. And there are parts of the Netherlands and the groups of Dutch society which are much better off in 1648 than they were in 1618. We shouldn't forget that there's a lot of areas that are not. Just a question of getting the balance. And that golden age, uh, 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 concept has, I think, um, concealed the fact that a large number of Netherlanders have a rotten 17th century. Uh, <coughs> the idea of people deal with weather, uh, 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 whereas historians deal with climate, yes, I like that too, I should certainly be using that. Uh, but there's a broader difference, and that is that climatologists look at big trends. Uh, and that, that's, forgive me, is, is a problem, because as you say, what matters to a historian is the year-by-year, month-by-month fluctuation. What climatologists give you is 30 years smoothed curves. But we don't really want to know about that. We want to see the spikes. We want to see those years which are intolerable, because if you happen to live through it, that's what's going to kill you. The fact that the average goes up on a 30 year smooth moving average is not really uh, uh, as helpful. So you get historians of climate who are looking at short-run factors and climatologists who are looking at long-run factors. But now all of their data is available on the NOAA site. We can distinguish it, but you're right. Uh, uh, we've got two different producers here of data and the consumers uh, are different. Historians really want to see the year-by-year -year fluctuation. And now all they have to do is go onto NOAA and find it. But they, uh, it, 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 until recently, that was one of the obstacles to historians trying to understand uh, climate history. <coughs> now, for you, um, you ask one or two little questions. Let me, let me just uh, linger over the one, did the Little Ice Age make the 30 years war more hellish, or did it precipitate some of the same events? Well, it does indeed start with the defenestration of Prague. The defenestration of Prague in 1618 is where they open the windows and they toss two Catholic councillors and their secretary out of the window. Uh, why did they do that? Because that is the way in which the Czech people, the Czech uh, repertory of uh, defiance involves defenestration. It's been done before. This is the, when, when, when the Czech elite, the Bohemian elite, defies the government, that's what you do. You throw the governors out of the window. And so that particular incident is anchored in tradition. Why 1618? Well, 
1617 has seen the centenary of Martin Luther's defiance of the Pope, which creates an enormous pamphlet war between Catholics and Protestants. Because the Protestants celebrate, they gloat, and they gloat a lot, and this really annoys the Catholics, and it raises the tension. And if you look at the uh, ego documents, the diaries of people at the time, many of which start in 1618, they all say, this is not good news. This is not good news. This gloating, this rivalry between Catholic and Protestants is going to lead to trouble. We're in exactly the situation today. Who knows what's going to happen in Ukraine? We watch the rhetoric on both sides and we feel something terrible is going to happen. And 1618 was the same. Uh, you also have a run of bad harvests. We now have harvest data, wine harvest data, grain harvest. 1617 is a catastrophic harvest. Uh, the worst wine vintage, the wine is so bad in 1617, it's just vinegar, nobody drinks it. So other crops probably the same, we just don't have this good uh, uh, material. So when in May 1618, there is a debate between Catholics and Protestants in Bohemia, it's going to lead to confrontation, and it's going to lead to throwing people out the window. So you open the window, and it spreads to Germany because they're already fired up. There's already the, the, the ground, the tinder, if you like, has been laid. Um, getting lost in that thought. Uh, but I do think uh, uh, the climate has an important role. It's incredible to me that it has not featured in any account of the Thirty Years' War of China. Nobody has noted the climatic aberration of 1617, 1618. What everybody notices at the time is, number one, the bad harvest. That's not what they blame going to your question, you know, of exactly what is going on. They blame comets, because there are three comets of extraordinary brilliance that appear in the sky in 1618. And everybody knows that the comet is a sign of really bad things about to happen. And the fact that there are three, in 1648 they said, well, we knew it was going to be a 30 years war because there were those three comets. Obviously, God was giving us a warning. And even that's why so many journals start in 1618, not because of the defenestration of Prague, but thank goodness they do because they record it. They start because of the comments. They know that something's going to happen. Something terrible is going to happen. And it does. So it's reinforced the set of explications. This is, a, this is an amazing you know, feat of scholarship that, 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 you have, that you have done and that you've now summarized so beautifully for us here. Um, but I'd like to invoke an Enlightenment figure who would have perhaps a slightly different take on this. This would be Immanuel Kant in his um, <coughs> Ideas for Universal History, where he writes, how does the human race advance? And he says it's through antagonism. It's through competition. And one thing that you didn't particularly comment on in your presentation is the way that the, this terrible the crisis actually provokes many different forms of dynamism and change. I could give three sort of fairly obvious examples. Empire, the Dutch, you know, maybe it's because of competition. They take a great deal. They literally take a great deal during the century. This is a great century of empire. To what extent would you link the development of empires to competition, to competition for less, for fewer resources? The second would be what goes now by the name of the Industrious Revolution and the beginning of new economic techniques, new forms of generating more wealth from the same base of resources. So again, a result which is not entirely negative, which comes out of these great disasters. And a third, rather different um, area might be political theory, because of course, very famously, we have somebody who speculates on this degree of competition and utter disaster and calls human life solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and invents something which becomes really quite astonishing in the history of political thought, and that has incredible ramifications over the next couple of centuries, at least. So I was wondering if you might comment on that and talk about this other side to the crisis and the way it stimulates advances. Well, thank you very much, David. I mean, those are wonderful questions. I, I feel slightly awkward answering with, with Ted. Rab sitting there, uh, since he was the one who, who showed the way to these questions, and really 
were just um, building on, on or standing on his shoulders, building on the edifice that, that, that he set up for us in, in his book on the growth of political stability. Excuse me, on political stability. Uh, uh, yes, all of the three things. Excuse me, I, I'm, I'm going to object to the first of the three things, the empire. I don't think in Europe that works. It certainly works in China. I mean, the Manchu doubled the size of China in the course of the 17th century. China is twice as big under the Qing as it does under the Qing. But the Europeans, yes, the Dutch gain, but who are they gain it from? From the Portuguese, the Spaniards, other Europeans. They make very few gains from non-Europeans. Uh, they get Macassar. Uh, uh, but really, it, and the, they get part of Taiwan, but then they're driven out. They're on the British. Hmm? The British. The British don't at this time in the 17th century. They do in the 18th century. We're sitting in the part of the British Empire of the 17th century, of course. You're right. Uh, but as Karen Kupperman said, a very, very uh, tenuous hold. Hmm. I mean, of all the bad years to found Jamestown, <laughs> all the bad years to try yeah. and uh, uh, New England, I mean, they're very close. Uh, and again, the um, evidence from climate shows that they had just picked, and uh, Drake is no better, or oh, lousy time to try and find Rowan. They just happen to come in these terribly adverse climates, and they make no provision. They keep, the Virginia Company keep sending people to the Chesapeake. They never seem to think, you know, how are we going to feed them? Well, you know, God will provide. And the same with the Puritans up there. Well, here, the Jerseys. But uh, uh, yes, you. Uh, 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 but you know, compared to uh, doubling the size of Ming China, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the few colonies, what are the few footholds that the English get in, in, in northeastern the United States? But you're right that that would be an exception. But on the whole, it seems to me in the 17th century the Europeans are gaining from each other. There are incremental gains. The big, the big imperial gain is China. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Manchus are the winners. They are the the Manchu bannermen are the winners in the 17th century. Uh, in 1644, they're all about to starve. That's why they have to invade China. And by 1674, 1684, they have taken over the biggest state and the most populous and prosperous state in the world. So they are winners. There's a lot of losers, including the other Chinese. So I do like your other two, which is the uh, the invention of the Industrious Revolution, a uh, wonderful phrase by Hayami Akira, and the idea of political thought. And I think both of them clearly stem from adversity. And if you wanted threes, I do like trios, uh, you could have taken perhaps a scientific revolution. The idea oh, that you, sure. you know, somehow there must be a way in which human ingenuity can deal with all this crap. And, and it, it, it's there in Japan with new knowledge. It's there in China. It's there in India, in Mughal India, uh, with the new knowledge. Uh, it's been a, a book about the new learning in India. And it's there in Northwest Europe, in especially the Netherlands and in England. And in England, Scotland, and the Netherlands, it prospers. And in India, it, you know, the wrong, you know, the wrong successor to the Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb, uh, 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 company, is not interested. The Ming get, but the Qing get really suspicious of these uppity Han, so they, they shut them down. They won't let them talk to each other. And gradually, they, they, their, their new learning is snuffed out. And the Tokugawa aren't real keen on people thinking, aren't real keen on thinking for themselves either. But all over. Uh, the Northern Hemisphere, you have these little groups of people who start thinking, it has to be right, it has to be right. The industrial revolu industrious revolution, clearly the idea that we can make more of what we have. Resources are, are tight, so we need to work harder. We need to invest more of our labor to make more of the, the smaller resources we've got. Yeah, I think that's a really good connection. Thank you very much for reminding me. Uh, but you know, as I say, Ted made all these points before, uh, but I do think how we get out of the crisis is just as interesting as how we get into it. And you had a question. And just to follow up, not, not so elegantly, but I was thinking of whether you can just become too much of a geographical determinist, Jeffrey Emperor. You write books on kings as well as climate. And, uh, and mm -hmm. I, I always think of your, your favorite king, P2, uh, Philip II sitting in the Scorial, whether he's really worrying, or P4, it's in the Greenwich Hero Palace, thinking of climate, or even weather, when 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 to de deal with certain problems of international politics, and in a sense you create set up a kind of uh, a, a zero sum game for yourself. You say, well, things are bad and people suffer, and, but at the same time, here's the pick up from David's notion: 
and this has to do with industriousness, but if you think of it at a lower level of, of human adaptability to change, and in, spa in, the, in, in the face of adversity, people find out they can find new forms of clothing to keep them warm, or they invent or import new form foodstuffs that are better to withstand the cold. <coughs> And it's no accident that perhaps because of chance of climate, that the potato start and corn maize you know, start creeping into northwestern Spain very powerfully, and other parts of northern Italy right at the very start of, of the ice ages. In the sense, perhaps in the long run, produce much more great, uh, more food, greater food supply and a more stable food supply for millions of people. In the sense. You, the box that you're in is that you're not being allowed for ch change or for adaptability. In, in the sense, you say, yes, we have only one result is death. And I'm not sure it's true that says. Let's stay <coughs> with maize. Let's stay with Indian corn. It's a particularly good example. Yes, Galicia. And yes, uh, the Po Valley. Uh, after the major famines of the 1630s, they start thinking, you know, we, we, can't, pick up, we can't continue to be dependent on rain. So they start bringing in this crop, which has already proved itself. Uh, uh, they grow it. They, 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 they manage to survive. And then the weather gets better, so what do they do, Richard? Do they stay with mixed farming? Do they stay with the maize? No. They go back to bread. They go back to cereals. They go back to wheat. And so they starve again. We are the ones who are hooked on corn. We are the ones who are hooked on. The corn is not for human consumption. Correct. <coughs> and you have it fragile, right? And, and if your pig eats it, why would you want to eat it? So there is, there is an element of tradition here. Uh, just like, you know, when the Czechs get annoyed with their rulers, they toss them out of windows. Uh, uh, in certain areas, and, and you're right, there, there are those two little, little cameos, uh, uh, you can see evidence of change. But what's interesting, if you look for long enough, like Rodel said, you need to watch your river for a very long time to see the pattern. They take it up, but as soon as they can drop it again, they stop cultivating it. If I can push you on this, though, this one of the lesson number three in sociological methods is not confusing correlation with causation. Mm -hmm. And you make an excellent argument that here's this pattern of El Nino, the sunspots, and here are all the bad things. Right. Can you give me a, a, an example where it is because of these kinds of pressures? That you get this kind of the, this process, which then leads to catastrophe. So again, things are worse for for a 17th century peasant in 1648 than they might have been. But how does that change then create the possibilities for a crisis? That's the part that I'm still worried about. It seems to me that um, I mean, as you noticed in each of the chapters, I have this idea of a tipping point. <coughs> the point at which it becomes very, very difficult to recover. And I, I have this little definition of a tipping point. Uh, I, I got it from, as most people did, I think, from Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, which came out in the year 2000, called The Tipping Point, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference. Uh, it's not new. Mathematicians have it uh, with bifurcation. Uh, uh, physicists have it uh, with the idea of phase changes. Ecologists have it in regime shifts. But it seems to me what you're looking for with a tipping point is a critical threshold at which the future state of the system can be qualitatively altered by a small change in force. And I think what you have in the period after 1618, which is a climate, which uh, a society, a world which has become so overpopular, even a small change is going to have catastrophic consequences. So yeah, you're right, I missed out the fact that the 16th century sees benign climate, warmer than usual, population expands. In the 1590s, you get a very sharp period of global cooling. Of course, terrible catastrophes happen, but it's only for 10 years, only, only a decade from this. It takes us back to 2004, when I, I was a meeting originally planned to deliver this book. So 2004 to 2014, we have you know, 10, uh, 10 winters like this. But then it warms up again. But in the 17th century, you get maybe 60 years like this, 60 winters like this. You can't live So what, what I'm looking at here is a society which is already pushing on the limits. Europe, most European societies complain there's too many people. China complains. 
Japan does not, because it's had the civil wars, it's had a century of civil wars, that's how I say this. Demographic cushion seems to be so important in allowing resilience to happen. Okay. If you're already at full stretch, there's a limit to how resilient you can be. And I didn't make that clear in my presentation. But I do believe what we're looking at in 1618 is a world that is already straining at the margins. Perhaps we're in the same position now. But, but, but back to adaptability, yeah. I mean, we could, David mentioned empire, but that's different than migration. Yes. And in the sense, if you look at the peopling of this area in North America, even the climates may be bad, it didn't stop them from coming in record numbers as soon as the Indian Wars stopped in the 1620s in, the, in, in Virginia and, and, and after the Pequot disasters in, in New England, the great migration is taking place. And in a sense, it is a response, perhaps, to, 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 to worsen conditions in, 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 in New England. Yes. I mean, in, in North Europe, but they move. It may be not much better climate-wise, but in a sense, they, they, they find ways to do it and, and find new areas to expand into. I don't know what's happening in China, and I don't know what's happening in, in South Asia. But you have vast movements of population that, that are taking place uh, without, in a sense, official. Well, sure, but what, how are you defining Section. vast numbers, Richard? I mean, the number Th of thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Tens not by 1640, it's not. It's about, no, it's about 40,000. And a lot of them go back. One of the things that really depresses the Winthrops <coughs> is this back migration. When, when Lord falls, when Stratford falls, there is such excitement. And the university, the college which has just opened at Harvard, becomes so alarmist that it sends the first fundraising mission to England <laughs> to try and get support for this school in New England, which is now hit on hard times. Because all of these people have gone back to fight in the Civil War. One of the regicides is, is a, a, a migrant, someone who's gone over, Vincent Potter. Uh, three of the colonels in the regiments, uh, uh, was it 14 of the first 24 graduates of Harvard, U Harvard College? go back to fight in the Civil War. So you get this back migration. I think you see this m very uh, powerful in-migration uh, uh, after the Civil War, but it doesn't go primarily to New England. Most of those migrants go to the Caribbean. Yes, well, and wherever they, 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 they die there. Sure. It does, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question, this flow. Nicholas Canning has done some terrific work on these flows. Um, you could look at the French, uh, the French going to the St. Lawrence, uh, and of course they multiply prodigiously. They, they're, they're again are among the winners. Those who come to New England, those who go to New France, are among the winners of the 17th century. Printers are great winners because everybody wants printed word. Uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, one of my reviewers pointed out that in my winners and losers section I miss out printers. Uh, but you know, the, the, I mean, when you say you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, um, compared to millions, I, I don't know about the internal. It's a question. It's a, you know, it's a question about itself. There are always little glimmers of light, even in the darkest night. <laughs> but if, if we're bringing, <coughs> excuse me, if we're bringing North America into the question, into the picture, the, the question I have is about the role of epidemiology, which you don't talk about, and the reason that they're able to come to New England, or more of them are coming to the Chesapeake and still more to the Caribbean, is because of uh, uh, the plague that's killing people out, and the reason that they're dying in the Caribbean is because of. of disease there as well, and I, I don't know what role, if any, epidemiology plays in what is otherwise. Well, there's two sides to that. Uh, I mean, number one, uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, when we talk about plague, we normally mean bubonic plague, and it's one of the two success stories in epidemiology from the 17th century, if you like, it's another plus, and that is that in Europe, at least, plague is conquered. The last plague epidemic in Sicily is 1624. The last plague epidemic in Scotland is 1647. The last plague epidemic in England, France, and the Netherlands is 1665. And it's gone from Western Europe. It's still there. It's still here in the United States. Go to Texas. But it's, it is contained. The second success is smallpox in China. They find it's not uh, uh, vaccination which is generous. It's variolation where you, you make a, a wound and you put a little bit of, 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 of pock in there so you get a mild reaction. And once one good thing about smallpox is once you've had it, you'll never get it again. If you survive smallpox, you have lifetime proof. Uh, but there's some evidence that smallpox and particularly yellow fever are more virulent in the 17th century for reasons we don't understand. So yes, there are definitely epidemiological changes in the course of the 17th century. 
But one of the things that the colonists in New England boast about, both with regard to England and with regard to Virginia, is it is so much healthier. And the index they use is not plague, but colds. They say if you go to a church in England, you can't hear the preacher for people coughing their guts out. And in New England, it's silent. No one has a cold. And then they say, look, all these Virginians are coming up to New England and lo, they come here ill and sick and coughing. And a year in New England, it's great. Well, perhaps an exaggeration, but there's certainly a consciousness, and you're quite right, there's a consciousness that there are healthy areas and less healthy areas. And they certainly see the old world as being an area of, of high disease and this brave new world, especially in New Of course, when you've killed off the Indian populations, or when they've died of smallpox, which Winthrop sees as God's deliverance, then they see themselves as a healthier society, and that's one reason for coming. It's certainly part of the sales pitch. Did, I, did, did I answer your question? No, you did. It's just that if you're talking about a third of the population dying in, in the 1640s or, or whatever, we don't have population statistics for the death toll in North America right. that can't that can participate in sort of your, your global calculus. And it seems like a lot of the, at least one continent of the story, or two continents, right. uh, are, are being left out. Of, of sort of what the what these climatological changes mean, uh, because because maybe you don't have the data, but that, that there's a larger picture going on because of those diseases here in the Americas. I, again, I go back to my answer to Richard. It's a question of, of, of numbers. There's 20 million Frenchmen. What's the population of New France? 20,000? No, no, I'm not talking about the European South. I'm talking about the Native Americans, oh, of which we don't know. Yes. And there are there are in that case millions, tens of millions. And, they, and they, the Europeans say we see these huge uh, where bone, they're walking these, on fields of skulls. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I, I just wondered if this comes up at all in in the larger narrative in the way that you're talking about it, because it, it seems like disease does play a tremendous role. So perhaps the bubonic plague does go down, right. but malaria, yellow fever, uh, uh, smallpox, smallpox is the big one. Are 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 ravaging the Americas, and, and that's not part of the story, it sounds like, of your story. I do think it's terribly important to see climate as just one of many factors. The, the emphasis here has been on a climatic situation which makes a lot of bad things worse. There are many other things making bad things worse, and I do think that one, I think Jeffrey in his book makes climate merely one player in this tipping point. There are many things which lead to the tipping point, and it's not only climate. And I think that's very important. Could, could I, um, Professor Rapp, can I flip your argument and say that climate uh, is, is my, my ground zero? Uh, climate changes, and various things make it worse or do not make it worse. I think there are very few areas of the northern hemisphere for which we have data which are not in some way impacted by this episode of global but you can have many things that will make it worse. And, and do I have time for one more example? Yes. Very short sure. one. Question. Oh, okay. let me take the question first. Well, it, it sort of follows on to Ted's question, so maybe it will be useful. Um, you wrote this book, or at least the epilogue, as a cautionary tale, right? And so the question is whether 21st century political uh, thought leaders, rulers, will uh, do the same thing that, that rulers did. Uh, in the 17th century, and that is, as you say, to turn crisis into catastrophe. But a lot has happened since then, and, and this is Ted's point, um, not just industriousness, but also uh, an industrial revolution, the advent of democracies, a March Ascend says that a functioning democracy does, never has a famine. Uh, the standard of living has gone way up, I'm not sure if Ted can tell me, but 17th century worker was probably spending about 75% of his budget on calories. The 20th century worker is probably closer to 25%. So you have this kind of uh, modern robustness to the sort of climate shocks that are driving but not determining your story. Um, do you think that added robustness, if that's the, the fair way to describe these ancillary factors, is, is, is um, going to be dampening uh, rather than amplifying, which is what your story says happened in the 17th century? Or well, are you less optimistic? Uh, I'm very pessimistic. Uh, but it seems to me that we have two narratives here, or two debates. One is uh, whether climate change happens. 
And the other is whether, if it happens, we're to blame. I have nothing really to contribute on the second part. But I want to show that it does happen and that however robust you are, there will come a point that may, it is perfectly possible that your supplies will not be adequate. In the state of Ohio where I live, we have enough reserves for eight days. Should some catastrophe affect the crops? Eight days, what do we do on the ninth? Now we haven't yet been put to that test. 1816 is the last time, which of course was the year in which Ohio was founded because 100,000 immigrants came from here, from New England. Well, you're not really New England, but in that area, so north of here. Uh, march across into Ohio to settle it because they cannot, they cannot make them. They just walk off their farm. They go to the golden Ohio country and even Indiana and a few to Illinois. If we have, and that's just one year without a summer, were we to have one more of that? Are we going to withstand it? I don't think so. But, what do we lose if we prepare a little better? What, 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 what is the real cost of preparing an infrastructure? So it seems to me that if you look at the past, it tells you to be prudent, that it's always cheaper to prepare than to repair. You saw that was Hurricane Sandy. I believe that did affect New Jersey. Uh, what exactly have we done to make sure that the next one will be less disastrous? Because there will be one. The sea level is rising. Uh, in my country, in Britain, you may have noticed my strange accent. Uh, there was a catastrophic flood in 1953, which killed only only 200 people. But in the Netherlands, it killed thousands. And both in the Netherlands and in England, there was a decisive movement to try and find some way of preventing it ever happening again. For 30 years, the local interests managed to prevent it happening. But then in 1983, the central government said, right, this has got to stop. We're going to have a Thames barrier. It is open, it has so far been activated 37 times. Because between 1791, the first time we have a measurement of high water at a flood tide, and 1953, the water level, the sea level goes up by three feet. Why it goes up may be to do with us, it may be all our fault, it may not. It really doesn't matter. It's risen three feet, there's no reason that should be reversed. And if that is the trend, does it not make sense to build some sort of Thames barrier here to protect your shore, to protect your <coughs> I don't see that happening. I don't see even a discussion of it happening. No, it's too expensive. More expensive than what? It was half a billion dollars to build a Thames barrier. But what's behind it is worth billions and billions and billions, not just economically, but also politically and socially. It is the heart of the British government. If you allow a flood, similar to the one that happened in 1663, described by Samuel Pepys. You're in real trouble. Well, Britain has tried, and this year with all the rain, it wasn't such a bad idea to improve the defenses. But I don't see the United States doing that, and I do feel a little pessimistic about that. So yes, we are more robust. And I have a problem with Amartya Sen, I must say. He argues that it's distribution, always distribution of and by. I say on the 17th century, there are which no distribution crisis could possibly explain. There just isn't enough food. And I worry about something similar happening. And on that happy Complexing note, uh, <laughs> thank you all very much, and thank you for a wonderful time.